yo soy Flor. Y yo soy Emilia. Y bienvenidos, bienvenidos al Transcripto, Transcripto edición, edición electoral. electoral. Esta semana el Transcripto viajó a New Hampshire para reportar desde un rally de Donald Trump. Se acerca una frente local de la campaña de Hillary Clinton. Explora la posibilidad de la legalización de la marihuana en Massachusetts. Y finalmente unos invitados le dan un análisis psicológico y histórico a la elección de este año. On Friday, October 28th, the transcript traveled to the Radisson Hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire, to a rally for Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Since announcing his campaign in June of 2015, Donald Trump's personality and rhetoric has captured the attention of the American people and media. In the 16 months since his campaign began, it has been easy for anyone to simply turn on the TV and hear about Trump and his campaign. But living in a largely liberal town, it was hard for me to access the viewpoints of the Americans who are standing behind Trump. I had the opportunity to meet and speak to Trump supporters, who were eager to share their visions for the future of the United States of America. My vision is I just want everyone to have a fair shot at everything. I want him to come in and clean up the, the, the Washington, D.C. I want the kids of the future to have a future. So I obviously support veterans, lock down the borders, um, get all the terrorists out that are here potentially and that are potentially coming here as well. Jobs is real, real important for, for families in the United States. He's just going to be a fantastic leader. He's going to be no-nonsense, Ronald Reagan-esque, and, you know, it's, it's all going to be great. I'm going to love it. I would hope that Donald Trump will stick true to his word about abortion, and I, I believe that a nation that will murder its unborn will do anything, and I'd like to be a nation that values life. He's going to protect the safety of my infants and my older children, and he's going to make sure that education and jobs are definitely put forward for the White House. As the rally began, the speaker's rhetoric turned the enthusiasm of the crowd into anger and contempt for the government and the mainstream media. Let me tell you, you ever heard the expression, a new broom sweeps best? Doesn't have any dirt down in there, it's just a good old clean broom, and get that baby out and sweep it out. It may not be the exact analogy, but let's sweep out that damn swamp down there in Washington, D.C. A broom will work this Earlier in the day, supporters had shown me where this anger and frustration comes from. In current Congress, do you feel like the Republican Party has consistently represented you? No, I think what's happened is they've represented themselves. They've forgotten all about us little people. I've never stood behind a presidential candidate ever. This is the first one I've ever, probably ever voted for. I've never felt, I've never had faith in any of the ones running. This is the first time ever. And I'm 37 years old. I like the fact he says things that politicians won't say. Frustration, concern, and anger with the current state of government and the presence of a political establishment are not feelings that are specific to Trump supporters or even to the United States. However, the voters I spoke to have focused on one person who they say epitomizes their concerns. Your tiny and this is is a Hillary voodoo doll with her um, hands on. I'm going to run to the mountain too. A couple of pins in her shut her mouth. And whatever. I worry about everything. She's corrupt. She's the most evil person that's walked the planet, and she's able to run for president. The youth of America, if you're watching out there in Northampton, you have a very simple choice. You can vote for someone who's a grifter and a grafter, and someone willing to sell one of the highest offices in the American public, uh, in the American system, or you can vote for someone who's new and fresh. Uh, I think one of the speakers tonight said, uh, nothing sweeps as good as a new broom. The visions for the future that Trump supporters expressed to me in Manchester were based in desires we all share. Safety, happiness, and prosperity. And many of their fears are common to a wide range of Americans, rooted in their own economic experiences and realities. Yet this campaign season has been one of contentious rhetoric and divided parties. With these hopes, fears, and the rhetoric of this campaign season on their minds, Americans will head to the ballot box on November 8th. 
Regardless of who wins, the next president will be tasked with unifying the nation and mending the deep divisions the election season has exposed. Hi, I'm Connor McClendon. On Wednesday night, I headed down to Strong Avenue to talk to some local Hillary supporters who are members of 413 for HRC. I'm Lily Lombard, and I'm a volunteer organizer with the Hillary Clinton campaign here in Northampton. So can you tell us how 413 for HIRC all got started? It's really a hub for organizing volunteers to uh, work on the elections up in New Hampshire. New Hampshire is our closest swing state. Not only is the presidential election there really important, but there's also a Senate race happening in New Hampshire that could determine the whole tilt of the Senate from Rep current Republican Senate to a Democrat one. How do you train the people that come here to volunteer? Our number one charge is to get live bodies up to New Hampshire to canvas door to door. And this coming weekend we have over 200 canvassers from Western Mass going up to southwestern New Hampshire to go door knocking for get out the vote. That's the phase that we're in right now is get out the vote. So it's helping people think through their plan on Tuesday, November 8th for getting to the polls. Do they, need to, um, do they need to take time off work? Do they need a babysitter? Do they have a way to get there? Do they need a ride? And we support them uh, in any of those gaps they may have. People who are reminded to vote, especially face-to-face, -face, are seven times more likely to actually execute that vote. And finally, do you ever contact people who identify as Republicans as well, or is it just Democrats? Oh, no. Um, you know, because this is such a weird race, <laughs> and Trump is such a strange phenomenon that he's turned off a lot of Republicans, um, that during the first couple of months in our canvassing up there, we were going to Republican, identified Republican uh, Party affiliates and unde undeclared voters, and asking them who they were planning on voting for and doing persuasion talks. And we identified lots of people who are going to be voting for Hillary Clinton, even though they are typical party, Republican Party voters and, you know, undeclared voters. We don't feel like we can take a single vote for granted. Thank you so much for talking to us. We'll let you get back to work. Hi, I'm Nell Sanders, and this is Tell It Like It Is, where all things controversial are covered. Recreational marijuana and ballot question number four is on the agenda this week. Voting day is around the corner, and for Massachusetts voters, question four will raise the issue on whether or not recreational weed should be legalized for people older than 21. I'm Paul Devlin. I'm from Florence. I already voted yes. The laws have been kind of obnoxious in the past towards weed, and... Uh, I feel like we need to lighten up a little bit on it. Do you think it should be regulated the same way alcohol is? I think it should be regulated like a, a similarly because it's it's on the same level as alcohol, I guess. You know? Back in 2012, the first medical marijuana initiative was first approved. However, the first dispensary wasn't open until 2015. What would it mean to legalize recreational marijuana? It'll be different from Colorado and probably more similar to Washington State, but the fear that a lot of local agencies have that have um, any reservations about legalization is that there isn't a lot written into it that allows for local control. So a few years ago, um, we all voted to decriminalize marijuana, and that passed with a wide margin. And a lot of people did that because of the social justice um, implications, myself included. I was just sort of like, why should people be going to prison for small amounts of marijuana possession? And then the next thing that passed was medical marijuana, which again was another kind of social justice feel-good vote. I think a lot of people in this community are really supportive of equality and social justice, which is great. Not that it's a foregone conclusion, but if it passes, it'll still be confusing because the federal government and the states aren't in agreement on how to classify this drug and how to handle this drug. However, there are big opponents to the Yes on 4 campaign, including our Massachusetts governor, Charlie Baker, who has spearheaded an opposition committee since April 2016. When it comes to question four, I'll be voting no, um, only because I don't see the upside to it. It, you know, I can understand why people would want to legalize it, but looking at the bigger picture, um, for instance, Colorado, they legalized it. And one of the biggest fears for me is, is what is that going to do for society? There needs to be some 
component to the law um, surrounding the use from youth. Yeah. Um, I would say if you're going to legalize it, make it like alcohol. The, the adolescent brain isn't done developing until around the age 24, 25. And if kids use marijuana or before their brain is done developing, studies have shown that the brain never fully develops. Um, and that's one of my biggest fears. Hi, I'm Meredith. The election is coming up soon, and it's unlike any election that came before it. I interviewed a Smith political science professor about his thoughts on this unique election. Um, my name is Greg White, and I uh, teach here at Smith College in the Department of Government, the political science department. We call it the Department of Government here at Smith. I think being a political science prof, and then also being middle-aged, <laughs> I have seen a bunch of elections. And this one is undoubtedly unique. What is it? I don't know. I mean, there's just something really profoundly going on in the American and in U.S. institutions, um, governing institutions that have been building for years, for some time now, with respect to immigration. Um, this has um, taking on a new life. In, in really intense ways. And I think what I would also point out too is that the United States is not unique in this regard. Um, the Brexit vote this past summer in the UK was in many ways mobilized around immigration. And in the last year and a half, two years, there's been the refugee and immigration crisis in the European Union. Uh, immigrants in general tend to be net less prone to criminality than the native, than the native born population. Um, but those are kind of facts that someone like uh, Donald Trump um, playing on fears that are um, real and perceived um, doesn't really pay much attention to. There is a greater attention in this election to race um, and race issues. And that could be in part because of President Obama, uh, the first African-American uh, president, and then in turn the traction that um, the birtherism um, um, movement uh, gained by questioning his Americanness, you know, whether he was genuinely American. This is the first election that I really think people have talked about whiteness and white identity and white privilege and white nationalism. Um, I think that's a big part of the Trump phenomenon is the support that he gets from the so-called alt-right. People vote for all kinds of complicated reasons. I mean, it's really true. And political scientists have spent a lot of time studying this. I mean, tons of dissertations have been written about this by graduate students and books written about trying to understand what motivates a voter. Um, sometimes people vote strategically. They think, oh, well, you know, my vote doesn't matter in Massachusetts because 75% of the voting population is going to go for Clinton. So. Massachusetts electoral votes will clearly go to Clinton. And somebody might have a different set of strategies if they lived in Ohio or Florida or North Carolina, you know, a battleground state. Each, it's, it's almost a, it's almost a cliche um, that each election is the most important election of our lifetimes. Um, I think this is up there. <laughs> this is really, really big. Yeah, we're watching it. Puedes ver más del transcrito a www.nhstechnology.org Y recuerda de votar este martes, noviembre 8.